and Kathy Lutz had found their dream home. The address was 112 Ocean Avenue, located on the south shore of Long Island, New York. The house had a swimming pool, a big garage, 4,000 square feet of waterfront, and they just had to have it. The realtor by law was required to tell them about a horrible event that happened inside the house years before. True story, November 13th, 1974. A previous resident of the home, 23-year-old Ronald DeFeo, fatally shot his mother, his father, his two brothers, and two sisters. The bodies were found face down in their beds, but despite the close proximity of the neighboring houses, nobody reported hearing a scream or a gunshot. Ronald DeFeo claimed the house was haunted, that ghosts had told him to kill his family. This is what... Realtors call psychological damage to a home, but the Lutzes were undeterred. This was their dream home. They didn't care what happened years ago. They loved this house, and so they started to move in. And on moving day, the family dog became distraught. He tried to flee the property. The dog jumped the fence, catching its leash on the fence, and almost hung itself before being rescued. Within days, the Lutzes started to witness strange occurrences. Liquid oozed from the keyholes of the doorways. The tap water turned black. Strange smells permeated the house. Doors slammed by themselves. Furniture moved. Carpets rolled back. Unexplained noises. Footsteps. And the sound of static, like television static in different rooms of the house. George Lutz began to get sick. He lost a whole lot of weight. At the suggestion of friends, the couple decided they would go from room to room throughout the house and recite the Lord's Prayer. At one point, the static reappeared, and a voice, a voice, could be heard audibly through the distortion, at one point screaming the words, Will you? These presences became even stronger. Kathy Lutz claimed she felt a presence, a physical presence, grab her. The children saw eyes peering through their windows. They saw cloaked figures. At one point, the daughter, Missy, told her parents she'd made friends with an angel named Jody. An angel that could change shapes at will. Missy told her parents what Jody had said to her one night. Jody had said, you'll live here forever. George would wake up around 3.15 every morning, and he would just go out to check the boathouse. Was he sleepwalking? We don't know. But later, he would learn this was the estimated time of day that Ronald DeFeo had killed his family years before. One stormy night, the house ultimately came alive with audible groans and distending walls, and the Lutz family made a hasty exit for Kathy's mother's home. Subsequently, paranormal investigators... Ed and Lorraine Warren joined a Duke University professor and the president of the American Society for Psychic Research to examine this house. Their official report included visual and audible evidence for ghost activity, including a group of shadows that took form and physically, physically pushed them as they stood in the cellar, scaring them almost to death. 
How much of this story is fact and how much is fabrication? Designated to fill the pockets of ambitious storytellers, that remains a source of fierce debate even now. But the haunting at 112 Ocean Avenue has become one of the most famous and most retold ghost stories of all time. Most famously in a 1977 book by J. Anson and a 1979 movie that became one of the most successful independent films ever made. All of this fuss over a quaint two-story house in Long Island in a little neighborhood called Amityville. In a story you've probably already heard to referred as the Amityville Horror. As we approach the Halloween holiday, it's unusual to be a non-believer in spirits and the supernatural and love stories about spirits and the supernatural as much as I do. And I know that many, many in our audience do. This time of year just sometimes can give you the creeps in the best possible way. And throughout the hour, actually about an hour and a half of the show, we're going to be taking your calls and talking about what your take is on the Halloween holiday. We've been asking people, what scares you? You know, the weird phobias, you shouldn't be afraid. You're a rational, thinking, reasonable human being. You're mature. You know better. But there's something about this that scares you. We'll be talking about that. We'll be taking your calls and sharing your messages. Barbara sent a message, and she said, of course, atheists can believe in ghosts. It's one of those fascinating things about the human brain. It can hold all kinds of mutually contradictory ideas at the same time without imploding. Atheists can believe in ghosts, homeopathy, alien abduction, etc., generally without breaking a sweat. I suspect it's a rare individual who applies skepticism to every area of his or her life. Our first caller on the show is famous from several shows ago because he was so memorable. (laughs) His name is Steve, and he's in Tennessee. Steve, thanks for calling the Thinking Atheist podcast. And in advance, happy Halloween. How are you doing, man? If I was doing any better, I'd be you, man. Are you you a celebrator of this evil, wicked holiday? You heathen? Uh, I'm not as crazy about it as as a lot of people. In fact, I, I get a little scared around Halloween. I don't know what it is. Um, I think I'm afraid I'll shoot somebody if they toilet paper in my yard. I drive around around here. It's huge where I live. I don't know how it is out there in Oklahoma, but it's huge over here. There's what? Is there anything that scares you? Are you spooked? Are you freaked out by? Come, there's got to be something. Uh, the prospect of uh, President Rick Perry, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I tell you what, you know, you know what really scares me about him is back. And back in the day, back when I was going to the uh, end timer church, you know, and, and every day was Judgment Day and everything on six o'clock news was straight out of the Book of Revelation. It, you know, it was okay because it was just a few of us in the woods. Now they're getting into politics. Well, and, you know, the religious have been in politics for a long, a long, long time. time. However, however, he, you know, he's part of that Dominionism movement. I don't know if you're familiar with that. If you're not, get get familiar. Uh, but they actually believe that they should be uh, – they're a group of people who are trying to get into key elements of business and politics so they can help bring on the apocalypse. Now, I don't know about you, but I know these people uh, of this mindset, and they, they seriously believe what they tell you they believe. And I don't want anybody believing it's his job to bring on the apocalypse having the uh, launch codes to the nuclear <laughs> armor. <laughs> Just, you know – but anyway, enough about politics. Well, any other thoughts on the Halloween holiday before I move on? I mean, come on, give me something good. Have you ever oh, been yeah, truly yeah, scared? Yeah, no, no. I, got a, I got a couple of examples of when I was scared. All right. To uh, kind of maybe 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 help you help illustrate how people can delude themselves and each other. Uh, one was I was out with my cousin one day. We were it was when I was younger, probably about sixteen. We were out hunting. Here we are, a couple of big strapping boys with loaded guns in the woods. And we come across this baby doll, this plastic baby doll laying on the ground. And it's kind of old. You know, it's just laying there. It's been there for years, and uh, no telling how it got there. But uh, we start getting kind of freaked out by it because it seems to be looking at us. 
And keep in mind, we're a couple of teenage boys. We're both pretty good sized fellers, and we've got loaded guns, and we're trembling in fear looking at a plastic baby doll. And finally, we decide to leave the area. Well, he goes back a couple of days later with his shotgun and blows this thing to a million people. <laughs> and I was like, I like, why'd you do that? He said, man, all I could think of is one of these nights I'm going to look out my bedroom window when it's dark and it's going to be floating out there. You know, but we, but another example of that, with a different guy, we were walking down the road one day with, uh, from my grandmother's house to my house, dirt road, woods on each side. We're walking, and I spot a tree, and I'm like, look at that tree. It's kind of gnarled up, small little tree been cut off, you know. I said, look at that. It looks like sort of a goblin or something. He says, he looks at it, and he goes, yeah, kind of like a dragon. And we start c- coming up with what this tree looks like, and we're kind of isolated. We're kind of in the woods there, and we're looking, and. We're just building up, feeding off each other a little bit to the point where I finally say, you know, we come from a very superstitious family. Ghost stories were our bedtime stories, okay? So oh, we're, we're kind of freaking out a little bit. And I'm like, finally, you know what? I'm going to prove that we're just scaring each other. I'm going to go up there, and I'm going to take a rock, and I'm going to just demolish this, this stump, this tree. So I go up there, get the biggest rock I can find, and I just deface this thing, you know, and I was like, well, he sees nothing, nothing. It's just tree, just dried up old wood. I get down there, I said, see, it was nothing. He looked at me, and he goes, uh, we weren't even looking at the same tree. So, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. just, you yeah. know, you get you, you get like a, a delusion. You get two delusional people together, and they will mirror and feed off each other. Dude, that's awesome. Well, I wish you and yours, if I may, a happy Halloween. Thanks for calling. <laughs> All right. Hey, man, I'm looking forward to it. Just don't nobody toilet paper in my yard. You got it, brother. We'll take it easy. All right, brother. You have All a good right. one. Did he say scary stories were their bedtime stories? What kind of sick parent does that to a young child? <laughs> the victims were disemboweled, honey, and all they found was an iron hook. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> so what scares you? I got a message from Edwin. He said, Big Bird scares him. Big Bird? Ever since he was a kid? Ted said, I have a fear of being alone in a room with a young child. That's some scary stuff. Liz says, I know it's completely irrational, but sometimes I get a little freaked when I'm standing by my bed like something's going to reach out from underneath it. Adam said, you know what scares me? Public men's rooms. I walk in, I see another guy, and I think, he's a rapist. (laughs) Must not make eye contact. Lucas said, I used to have a weird fear that I would wake up while a big tarantula was crawling out of my mouth. It's a wonder anybody in our audience got any sleep. Area code 740, you're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? This is Dave. Dave, what's going on? Well, um, I'm, um, uh, like like most of our listeners probably, I'm a big skeptic. I'm not a person who um, really believes in ghosts or uh, things like that. I'm working um, uh, for charity in a haunted house. Um, this it's all October, so that's been kind of fun getting and with, with being around people who are like really into that stuff. But it's never been me. But um, um, every um, other, all of my girlfriends and women that I've ever been with have all been really deeply believers in that stuff. And my current girlfriend um, is actually keeping a blog. Um, about all of her experiences through her life, which I'm helping her edit. And uh, so um, I've been um, like delving into that a little bit with her. And uh, um, she's, ever since she's, she's in her 50s now, and ever since she was a little girl, she's always felt like there was, you know, something following her, something, I don't know if it's, I don't, she, I don't, she doesn't really know if she feels like, she's, like it's watching over her or if it's um, benevolent or Maleficent, or if that's the right word, I'm not sure if that's a word. Probably malevolent's uh, the word you're looking for. Did, tell, is she one of is she one of those people that she says that she has like a kind of a spiritual barometer? Like I can just walk into a room and sense things. Does she say things like that? Uh, it's a little bit like that. She's not. She's not so much like that. Uh, I have other. I have other um, friends that are like that. Um, uh, but uh, she's not so much like that. She's just uh, uh, somebody who uh, just constantly feels like there's somebody watching her. Uh, is more her thing. I think she just feels like she's always being watched. And she but, can't um, tell if it's a guardian angel or some sort of uh, a sinister force. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Like, she'll, like she's she's felt like um, in the past she's felt like she was she's woken up and 
I, 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 I chalk it off to lucid dreams, but she'll feel like she wakes up and there's eyes on her, like somebody's watching her, and she really doesn't know whether it's good or bad that that's happening. That, that, you know, like she doesn't, she doesn't know who it is. But there, she has one story that she tells in her blog, which um, I, I can't explain away, where um, she gets up in the middle of the night, and um, she's, a, she's a, a early teens at this time. Uh, she gets up in the middle of the night, and she's living with her grandparents at this time. And um, she's walked, she goes down to the um, kitchen to get a, something, a glass of milk or whatever it was, I forget. But she goes down, and um, there's a guy sitting in a chair with a cane. And she walks by him, and he says something to her. And she says, "Do you um, are you like waiting for my grandparents? Are you waiting to talk to them? And she, he says, no, um, I'm just here. Um, sitting here and so she goes into the kitchen and he comes back she comes back out and he's not there and the chair's not there and um the next day she asked her grandmother who that was in the house and her grandmother says there was nobody in the house but um if that's if that's a waking dream which i assume it could be it's pretty elaborate to me so that's the only story that she's told that i don't feel like i can just chalk off it's a wonder the woman falls asleep at night it seems to me she was really (laughs) <laughs> it really is. It really. Is. She hears things in this house all the time, like people walking. Down, and, and I've actually heard some of them too. And yeah. at, uh, one time, one time we were lying lying together in bed, and we both felt some. And it could have just been shifting, but it, the, the bed, it felt, it honestly felt like somebody got into the bed. And um, uh, <laughs> neither one of us had moved. <laughs> and, and because we both experienced that one. That was another one that I have a hard time talking about. But it really just felt. I just I just talk it off to something like the bed shifted, and we just don't understand it. And it's, you know, but, sure, but the bed just shifted, and we <laughs> felt like something got in with us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, thanks for the call. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it very much. Hey, thank you. Bye-bye. All right, take care. Wow. Derek sent me a message. He said, speaking as an atheist who lives in, quote, a haunted house, complete with poltergeist activity, I don't believe in dead spirits, but rather in interdimensional bleed. Speaking from the viewpoint of the belief in alternate realities, sometimes those realities get so close together that they shade into each other, causing visual, audible, and sometimes physical, unexplained phenomena. Our house has been haunted ever since I can remember. I've seen things move on their own, shadows and even fully visible forms on occasion. I've felt physical manifestations occur. I've been touched by someone who I couldn't see, but when I reached out to it, my hand passed right through the shade before it disappeared. Trust me, it's even freakier when you experience it rather than just reading it. You know, I experienced interdimensional bleed once. I just figured I just needed to eat more bran. You know, <laughs> it's just one of those things. Area code 905, thanks for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? Uh, hi, it's David. David, what's up? Oh, well, um, I'm a Catholic. You know, I was a Catholic, I mean. <laughs> um, like, I'm, I'm 17, and I went to World Youth Day um, last summer, and... You know, it, the stuff that we started talking about in little group meetings just started to really scare me, you know. Um, one thing, I don't, I, have you ever heard of Padre Pio? I have not. Um, he's this, like, like Catholic saint guy, and, you know, we, like, a lot of Catholics revere him. That Ever heard of Stigmata? Yes. Yeah, and he had, like, self-inflicted stuff. Well, um, I remember we were talking in the group about this stuff, and... They start talking about how the devil attacked Padre Pio. And this type of stuff, it doesn't really scare me, but I just can't believe people believe in it. Now, I'll read you something from this like, Catholic website I found. The devil attacked Padre Pio with numerous types of temptations. Padre Augustine also confirmed that the devil appeared to him under many different forms. The devil appeared as young girls that danced naked, as a crucifix, as a young friend of the monks as the spiritual father or the provincial father, as Pope Pius X, a guardian angel, as St. Francis and as Our Lady. And, you know, sometimes, you know, the devil would appear and attack him, like, physically. And it just, I can't believe it because I'm, I'm rational. Like, I don't believe in ghosts, right? I, although the, the, internas- the interdimensional thing that the guy talked about the last time, like, it was interesting. But, I don't know, it just, I, as a Catholic, I look at some of this stuff, and it's just, like, as an ex-Catholic, you know, I'm an atheist, but... Like my yeah, parents, well, they say, they say yeah, it with a straight face. You know, he was attacked physically. Yeah, yeah I, I yeah, get all that. 
And it just drives me nuts that, you know, people believe in this stuff. You know, stigmata. Like, he self-inflicted probably the wounds with acid. But, you know, people look at it like, oh, you know, Jesus, he was sharing his pain with this Padre Pio. And I, I just, I don't believe in the supernatural. I just find it that the, the faith part of the super, like, the, that the fact that people use the supernatural things to enchant their faith just, just drives me nuts. Oh, you know, how many times have we heard about the bleeding Virgin Mary statues? And oh, it turns out it's, you know, red dye number whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's amazing. The blood looks tremendously like food dye. Hey, thanks for the call, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for being a part of the show. Thanks for today. the show, man. I love it. <laughs> All right. And happy Halloween in advance to you. My favorite ghost stories are the ones that are grounded in supposed reality. And here's a great example. 29 Hanbury Street in London. September 8th, 1888, 6 a.m. An elderly man walked down the stairs of his residence and opened the door leading to the narrow passageway outside. And what he saw in front of him shook him to his very core. Witnesses report the man bursting from the alley, his eyes wild with panic and fear. He led others to his gruesome discovery. The murdered and mutilated body of a woman her dress was pulled up around her knees, her throat slashed, her intestines removed and laid across her shoulder. Several internal organs were missing. The adjacent building, the Truman Brewery, soon reported strange chills that drifted through the boardroom almost always at 6 a.m. A headless form reported standing by the wall of the storeroom almost on top of the very spot where the woman died. And even now, more than a century later, people travel across the world to visit the murder scene and attempt to see, hear, feel the victim communicating to them from beyond. What singles this particular story out? Above the hundreds of other grisly accounts... What makes this particular woman and her supposed ghost so famous? She was Annie Chapman, the second victim of a real-life monster whose name is even more chilling and even more famous, Jack the Ripper. Two four zero, you're on the uh, Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? Caitlin. Caitlin, happy Halloween. <laughs> what are you doing? Well, I have a couple of questions. Uh, I'm a new atheist, and my fiance's been an atheist for a while. And, you know, Halloween is pretty much my favorite holiday. I used to be Wiccan, and, and everything draws, you know, the whole Halloween scenario just draws me to it. I love every spooky thing. I love the stories, the movies, et cetera. But one thing I'm still battling with is I had a you know, scary scenario a while ago when I was going through a rough patch and pretty much I'd woken up in the middle of the night and I'd heard like the voice, I don't know, just weird voices everywhere and stuff in my book, my bookcase had fallen off and being an atheist, you know, there's so many rational things I could say why it happened, you know, maybe things were teetering off the bookshelf, etc. But, I don't know, every, every, every year I always think of that time and I have no way to explain it. <laughs> I'm going to have you back off your phone just a little bit. I don't know if it's distorted on the air, but it's it's a little bit crushed in my headphones here. So uh, so I can understand you just uh, just a couple inches off the, the phone. Are you asking me how an atheist would interpret something that was supposedly supernatural or ghostly happening in their lives? Is that what the right. question is? Exactly. Well, you know, I, do, I, do I have an explanation for why people see... Um, figures walking down hallways and why they hear sounds and why they experience phenomenons and temperature changes. I think in this wildly complex world, uh, I think people are extremely susceptible to the power of suggestion. Have you noticed most of the encounters take place at night? You know, I mean, right. your vision's not as good. You're, you're, maybe you're not as alert. Who knows what your environment is like? Sometimes those things can be triggered by just certain um, – in, they have what they call the God helmet, which actually mm -hmm. stimulates portions of the brains with electromagnetic fields, and people hallucinate, and they see all kinds of things. They are convinced they are absolutely real. So I, I'm not being in the room, not being able to see, do I think it's real? I, my experience has been that the power of the mind and the power of suggestion is is 
there's probably something chemical happening. <laughs> there's yeah. probably a physical explanation. I myself, I need hard evidence to prove. And honestly, you know, part of me wishes ghosts were real. How much fun would that be if we had an actually a supernatural plane and we could talk about these things as if they are true and we can talk to our dead relatives and there's there's Marley's ghost going up this stairwell to visit Ebenezer Scrooge. What What an amazing <laughs> dimension it would be to open up. But by and large... It's like watching those ghost shows on television. Have you seen them? I made yes. fun of them last year, but I'll rehash for those who have not heard that particular podcast. But they find essentially for these ghost hunter shows a haunted prison, haunted hospital, haunted house, haunted whatever. And they take three of the dumbest dudes you've ever seen on the planet. <laughs> And they give them these, you know, electromagnet meters and they give them temperature meters and laser thermometers and video cameras. And they throw them in this place like they're going to be reputable representatives of the scientific community. And for six to 12 hours, they just scared the crap out of each other. Hey, Gimper, did you hear that? <laughs> I heard a door slam somewhere. Play that EVP back. And then they play something back that sounds just like static. <laughs> He said the name of your dead ex-wife. You know, <laughs> just nonstop. Yeah. By and large, it's just three stupid guys scaring the crap out of each other. So uh, that would be my guess. I'm sure there's a physical explanation. But you'd be safe as those books right. are falling off the shelf, okay? All righty. Thank you. Take care of yourself. All righty. Bye. I, uh, growing up, was forbidden to participate in the darker aspects of the Halloween holiday. We were a devoutly Christian family, so we could dress up as, you know, you could even be Dracula or the Wolfman or something, but no witches, no demons, nothing like that, because obviously we didn't want to give Satan his due on this Halloween holiday. In fact, part of me feels like that my family allowed the children to participate only grudgingly in the Halloween holiday, you know? And then you see those churches, they it's all Bible characters. Well, he's going to be coming as Moses tonight for the Halloween thing. They do something called trunk or treat, which is a way to keep kids off the streets and keep them from going to strangers' houses where they fill up the trunks of cars with candy and you go to a church parking lot and then the kids just go from trunk to trunk to trunk and reach in and pull out candy and goodies. And, and the church has really tried to sort of co-opt the holiday, though those who don't know the origins of Halloween would be surprised just how involved the church is in Satan's supposed holiday. Area code 727. I'm so glad you waited. You're on the Thinking hey. Atheist podcast. Who's hey. this? this is Eric. Eric, what's up? You were just brought up I was brought, brought about the church being involved. I want to go, go more in depth in it. Please do. We talked about Sam Hain and all that stuff with the with the Celts and everything, the Druids. Uh, I'm going to get into that, but uh, basically, uh, of course, the church holiday that they, they that they decided to start was called All Hallows Eve. If you look in church history, you know the Catholic Encyclopedia, it says it's All Hallows Eve on October 31st, and of course they they decided to co-opt that day like they did with Christmas. They, they they understood people were ce still celebrating Samhain, uh, so they decided, well, we we, we got to have a holiday, and we'll, we'll do All Hallows Eve, and we'll involve a bunch of dead people. Sure, while the Celts are trying to light bonfires and wear costumes to ward off the, the ghosts and the spirits, Pope Gregory, right? He designates yeah. November 1st as that time to honor all the saints and the martyrs, right? All yeah. Saints Day in the evening before was All Hallows' Eve, now known as Correct. Halloween. The church is hugely involved in the Halloween holiday, folks. Yes. And most and people that, have no idea. They just think it's Satan's yeah. Day, right? And, and uh, there are other holidays. Uh, Easter was originally a, a, um, a pagan fertility goddess. Do you know that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and of course we all know the the pagan uh, origins of Christmas. So it's just the church has just got, gone and co-opted all these holidays to get people's minds off of their original beliefs. Yeah. And, well, and, and and I think they're banking on the fact that most people won't do the homework and find out what history really yeah. says about these holidays. I mean, these are the same people who believe that Jesus was actually born December 25th. Oh, what a great day. Yeah. He was born on December 25th. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, but, uh, uh, could, could you imagine shepherds uh, herding sheep in December in Israel? Um, I'm pretty sure it's cold in Israel at that time of year. I don't think they're outside herding sheep, right? Yeah. You know, I thought about doing a whole other show before the 31st that, that was dedicated only to the haunted history of Halloween. What it is, how it began. We'll talk about the Celts and the Druids and, and, and you know, where Trick or Treat came from. We, I actually did a, a, a feature on this. Believe it or not, when I was in Christian radio in the 90s, we were yeah. talking about the origins of Halloween, and we were speaking, actually, about how, hello, folks, a lot of the stuff came from the church. And I yeah. thought about doing that. If, if time permits, I'll see if I can get something on the calendar yeah. before the 31st. And, I, and uh, getting to my Christian, or uh, when I was a Christian, I actually went to a church that decided, hey, guess what? Martin Luther was born on this day, so we'll celebrate Martin Luther Day. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Well, where I, I come not from, it's, it's not many places don't even call it Halloween. They call it a harvest festival or a yeah. fall festival. Essentially, what yeah. they're trying to do is create a happy, uh, kind of an airbrushed version of a holiday, which honestly is a whole lot less fun. And then they go out and, and do their thing. And, and most yeah. of the kids are desperately wishing they could dress up as something with a mask and a chainsaw and go door to door. And all the parents go, oh, my God, look at the little killer. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. You look so deadly, honey. Come here and look. Take, bring your camera. Eric, thanks for the call. Very much appreciated. Yeah. yeah. On my uh, Facebook page, I've been asking, what scares you? Evelyn said, the sound of wind and palm trees on a windy day totally creeps me out. Kate said, sleepwalkers. Oh, totally get that. You ever talk to somebody who was sleepwalking, actually spoke to you? It's happened to me. Freaked me out. Their eyes are open. They're looking at you. They're talking. They're asleep. Deborah said, I freak out if a road is too close to a lake. I just think my car's going to crash into that lake and I'll be trapped. Vicky said, you know what scares me? Those singing Santas. About five feet tall, and they move in their arms, and they sing Christmas carols. Totally freaks her out. Shana said, escalators and Christopher Walken. <laughs> <laughs> Christopher Walken is awesome. Area code 937 on this ghostly podcast. Thanks for calling. What's your name? It's Brian. Brian, thanks for being a part of the show. What's your take on all of this? Anything spook you or scare you? You have a scary story or an opinion about the holiday? Well, I don't really have a story. Uh, you were talking earlier about the origins of Halloween. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was wondering if you're aware, uh, lately when I read the debate online, I find a lot of Christians are trying to argue that uh, Halloween was originally a Christian holiday and that the pagans stole it from them, and now with the harvest festival and everything, they're just trying to claim it back. I was wondering if you knew anything about that. No. Look, look it, it was a response to previous Druid holidays, and, 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 but, but it wasn't that the church created it and then it was stolen by Satan. I noticed that a lot. It's more of that Christian revisionist history sort of going on. Uh, I just started to see it. I was wondering if you knew anything about that, because I'm well aware. I used to be pagan and Wiccan and all that fun stuff, so I'm well aware of the origin, the original meaning of the holidays. Well, but, I, uh, the, you know, the challenge that I have is is that so many sites like the Answers in Genesis crowd, most of those sites, essentially posit as fact a lot of this type of information. Now, I don't know if they've addressed Halloween, but I'm guessing if they did, they would be addressing it much like they have addressed the fossil record and the origins yeah. of our universe, that's, where they throw something exactly out. I, that's exactly what I thought of when I started reading those things. It's just like the young earth creationists. They just take action. History didn't go down the way they wanted it to, so they just change it the way they yeah. wish it would have been. If my Facebook page is any, and YouTube page is any indication, what happens is without doing any research, without doing any background checks, what many people, fundamentalists, will do is they'll go to a deal and they'll read something like that. Like, the church actually began what was a wonderful holiday and it was stolen by yeah. the devil. 
rather than research that, right? It's just a cut and paste fest. They just grab it and post it as truth everywhere they go, and it is now fact. And I think that's honestly what the answers in Genesis Crowd and Ken Ham and those people bank on. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, look- it just really gets on my nerves because Halloween is one of my favorite holidays, and I hate it when they do that. And for some reason, with Halloween specifically, it just really irks me that they're trying to not only whitewash it after the fact, but go back and make it a Christian thing to begin with. Like I've heard that uh, trick-or-treat started with uh, little kids going from door to door offering to say prayers for people in exchange for candy. No. That's not even close. I know that's, that's not, not even true, in the zip code of the truth. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. All right. Well, you know what? I may have to do a show on this. Now you got me all riled up. Thanks for calling, well, man. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. All right, and have a wonderful and happy Halloween, okay? Take care. You too. Bye. You know what my phobia is? Actually, I've got two. Should I should I waste time with both of them? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, the first phobia I have is being in the water, and there's something large under the water, like uh, an object, a vehicle, an animal, I don't know, just something, and I can't see it. Freaks me out. Even now, i got goosebumps. I'm, a, I'm an advanced open water scuba diver. I can, I can dive. I can, go, I can go 100 feet down. I can go into caves. I can go anywhere. And I'm, I'm groovy. I'm wonderful. I surface, okay? I'm on the surface. And I'm just hanging out, treading water until I get a chance to board the boat. It freaks me out. <laughs> it just totally freaks me out. And if it's dark water and you can't see anything, but the imagination can jack with you. The second story I, I probably carry with me here into my 40s. I don't, I'm hesitate to tell this because it, it's hard to. It's not scary when I tell it, but I was five, okay. And have you ever had a recurring dream? Well, when I was, I guess it's one of my earliest memories. I guess I was four or five years old. I had a recurring dream. I had it over and over and over, and I call it the mad airplane, okay. I called it that when I was a kid, and it just stuck. And it's a story my family tells all the time. And here's essentially how it went, okay. In my dream, I wake up. And I look down the hallway. My bedroom door is open. Now, I'm dreaming, right? I look down the hallway, and there's the door to the bathroom. And the light is on, but the door is closed. You just see that rim of light around the door, like the door is cracked. You know the light on is inside. And as I'm lying there, the door is open. The door opens. Right? And there's a tiny model airplane. It's about two feet long. It's metallic with a blue stripe. It has a little flashing light on the top, and it's making a small jet noise. And it starts to move toward my bed. It's probably 25 feet. And it's playing. I hesitate to to say this because you're going to laugh out loud. But it's playing that song from... what's What's that theme song? How long does it last? Can love be measured by the hours in a day? Is it love story? (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) But but it's playing this tune. And it's coming down the hallway at me. And just before it gets to my bed, I jump out of my bed and I run down the hall and I hop into bed with my folks. All right? So I curl up and I'm safe and... I wake up at that moment back in my own bed and I look down the hall and I see the bathroom door. Now the light's not on, but I see the door. It's in the same position. I wake up in the same way and I know that at any moment the dream will repeat itself. (laughs) I must have had that dream like five consecutive times and I'm in my 40s and it still wigs me out telling the story. It is so bizarre. Area code 505. Thanks for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? Hey, my name's JD. When I was in middle school, some of my friends uh, had this ghost hunting fantasy that they were uh, going to become like the Ghostbusters and they created fake gear, fake suits and 
we live in an area of, um, it's New Mexico, so we've got a million ghost towns, and they were obsessed with going to these ghost towns and walking around trying to find old dead bodies of the mutilated housewives of the cowboys. So it, it led to some pretty interesting conversations, such as um, down the street from our school, there was a, a house that was due for demolition. And in this house, of course, um, n- nobody lived there. But uh, some rumor had been started that there was a murder that had happened there 500 years ago, um, which is absolutely ridiculous, of course. At this time, we had uh, laptops for our school. So they set up their school laptops on photo booth and would just keep them recording there all day until they found a little blip in their screen that they could classify as evidence for the ghost. And anyway, the next day they brought that back to school and everybody got incredibly riled up because (laughs) this house was right next to the school. So everybody thought that they were all going to get killed by this floating orb of light that had appeared in the ghost hunting screen. It's like the ghost shows that you talk about. What's your take on it? Are you a skeptic or did you believe? Oh, I'm a total skeptic. Although my problem always is I have just the worst imagination that I cannot control. So although I although I believe that it's absolute crap, that I, I can just lay in bed all night and keep shaking of things that my brain invents. I get so. that. Look, I'm a, I consider myself a huge skeptic. You put me in a dark room with that clown from Poltergeist, my ass is gone, baby. Yeah, oh, <laughs> yeah I know that feel. <laughs> Well, have a a wonderful Halloween holiday. Thanks for being a part of the show. You too. Take care of yourself. There was an interesting story that I had read uh, a couple weeks ago. There may be some outside of these borders, and unfortunately some within who may not know about the American Civil War. It began in 1861, and it continued for five long, bloody years. Now, Abraham Lincoln had been elected president of the United States on a platform of abolishing slavery. Now, upon his election, 11 southern states declared their secession from the U.S. They formed the Confederate States of America. The nation divided on the issue of slavery, union against Confederacy, anti-slave versus pro-slave, fighting over the rights of states and federal rights and commerce and land and taxes and tariffs and whether slavery was immoral and barbaric or an honored tradition and just good business. The nation split. The divide ultimately exploded into all-out war. By the time the Confederacy surrendered to the Union, April 9, 1865, an estimated 625,000 soldiers from both sides lay dead. The first shots of the Civil War were fired at a harbor in Charleston, South Carolina. Citizens of Charleston may have already heard this story about a woman. She was a laundry worker. She washed clothes, moved to Charleston uh, shortly after the war ended. Now, every night at midnight, she would find herself awakened by the sound of heavy wheels on the street. Every night at midnight. But she lived on a dead-end road, very little traffic, certainly none at the midnight hour. And her husband said, oh, honey, come on, you're just hearing things. You're dreaming things. It's just your imagination. Close your eyes. Go back to sleep. And yet every night at midnight, the heavy wheels would roll past without any explanation. Finally, the woman mentioned this to another woman washing clothes at a tub next to hers. And the other lady said, oh, oh, what you're hearing is the army of the dead. The story goes that Confederate soldiers died in a nearby hospital after April 9th, 1865. After the surrender. After the war was over. But no one ever told these dying men the war was ended. And so every night at the stroke of 12, the soldiers rise from their graves and march to Virginia to reinforce General Robert E. Lee in his battle against the North. And so the next night, the young lady slipped out of bed and waited. She waited by the window. And at the midnight hour, a dense gray fog appeared. And within the fog, the shapes of horses and the sounds of gruff human voices, the rumble of rolling cannons and the sound of marching feet, soldiers, horsemen, ambulances, wagons, weapons, draped in vapor and gray as ash trotting forward to a ghostly battleground long since abandoned. 
And as the final soldiers disappeared in the mist, the woman emerged from her daze to realize that all of a sudden she was unable to move her right arm. She was partially paralyzed, as if the fog of death had brushed against that limb so close to the window and rendered it useless forever. And for the rest of her life, she clumsily but dutifully scrubbed the day's laundry with the arm that remained, knowing that she had given the other to the army of the dead. So what scares you? Is it noises? Is it that hunch you feel when you walk into a room? Is it a certain movie monster? Is it a scenario from your youth that plays out as you are a rational adult who should know better, but somehow it still gets you? Mark said, when I was a kid, my older siblings told me the roots in the dirt at the bottom of the sandbox were from plants growing in hell. And that if you tugged on them, it would... Summon the devil, and he would come after you. Jeez, Mark. (laughs) Juliana said, whales totally scared the crap out of me. They're big, they're in water, and you totally can't see them until they're right under you. Ben sent a message and said he's scared of dead trees. The way they float and follow you while walking deep in the woods, making that sickly muffled thump sound as they bury themselves back into the soft soil. Immediately, whenever you look back, oh yeah, they're walking. They're following you. Area code 405. Thank you so much for waiting and happy Halloween. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? Uh, This is Chris. Chris, appreciate your patience. What's going on? I was going to say that wait to call is scary enough. But um, I have a story from when I was a kid. Um, you're familiar with hell houses, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, do you want to explain um, to the audience, or would you like me to, what hell houses are? Uh, I believe you can explain it better than I can. All right. Well, let me make sure I'm on your page. What churches often do in their co-opting of Halloween for their purposes is they are turning the haunting, haunted house into an evangelical opportunity, a way to scare people into receiving Christ. So what they do is they put together a themed haunted house, and it is, it's usually, and it's got some creepy stuff in it. They may throw a guy with a chainsaw, and they may some throw some other stuff, but then they also throw in a lot of reality-based stuff. There'll be domestic violence. There will be somebody who commits suicide. I remember one where they showed a lady who blows her brains out, and there's blood all over the wall, and they, they talk about uh, substance abuse and gang activity, and essentially they're tying in real-world horrors into this haunted house experience. But as you get closer and closer to the end, it gets darker and darker and darker and more real. Then they say that this is what the world is like without God. And they quite often will have Jesus on the cross at the end, or they will have some sort of a, a, a Jesus was, was killed, but he rose again. They will essentially take you through the horror, but at the end give you hope. And then they will have counselors waiting for you to come out of this hell house to lead you to Christ in a salvation prayer. They use it as a way to get young people scared of not being saved. Did I get that pretty much accurate? Yeah, that's pretty okay. much it. All right, well, um, let's go from there. What do you got for me? Yeah, when I was a little kid, I would say I was maybe like nine or eight. I was really young, and uh, my mom and dad recently they separated and they got back together, and it was just Halloween. My dad decided to take me and my sister to a hell house, two of them that night. The first one, it was um, it was pretty tame by modern standards, but when, um, when I went through it, I was terrified. The first one, it showed a couple, a loving couple, who engaged in premarital sex. And they were coming home from a dance when they got into a car crash. The thing that I remember most is they actually got, I believe at the time, Channel uh, Fox Channel here. They actually got the news anchors to make a fake news story, so it's even more realistic. And they showed them being tortured in hell, um, really graphic torture. And at the end, you see a bright, bright light, and there's a uh, a teenager, like a, a uh, 13-year-old teenager, dressed up like Jesus. And uh, 
they take you away and then you pray. Well, you had to pray to get candy, so like did like a half ass pray and I got like a Snickers. Wait, wait, wait. Next, wait, wait, wait a minute. They made the children pray to yeah, get pray. treats. Um, they uh, they made us pray to Jesus, and as a reward for us praying to Jesus, we were able to get candy. Now my blood is already boiling thinking about yeah. this. The second one, you'll probably get really mad. Oh. Um, the second one, this one was notorious because the last couple hell houses, they had to close them down because of the graphic nature of it. This one was even more graphic than the, um, the car crash. And the car crash actually showed, like, photos of real car crashes and calls and stuff. This one, it shows another couple who engage in premarital sex. Um, the woman decides to get an abortion. So they showed the graphic betrayal of a woman being aborted, her strapped to the to the, uh, the little chair thing. Whoa, and whoa, how, whoa. It, Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You got kids going through, and they're reenacting like a back alley abortion thing? Yeah. yeah. Like the, are they, they're doing the clothes hanger, or was there a doctor, or what are we talking it about here? There was a doctor. There was oh. a doctor, and they were, like, ripping out, like, fake guts and such. It was, it was really nasty. And after that, they showed uh, the boyfriend. Apparently, the woman apparently died from the um, from the procedure, and it showed him blowing his brains out. I, I did a haunted house um, back when I was a believer. It was a Christian-themed thing. It was real hardcore. It was the same deal. I mean, they show the guy committing suicide, and they show the girl is addicted to drugs, and she's weeping, and there's syringes all in her arm. I mean, you know, they're put, they're trying to be as dark and as heavy as they can. Under the guise that, man, this is real, man. This is this is what Satan's doing to our young people, and they need rescue. And, of course, the very last thing, once they've completely freaked these kids out, is they had Jesus Christ. And his back was turned to you, but he was obviously on the cross. And then the cross turned 180 degrees, and you see him, and he's covered in blood. He's all gashed up, and he's got spikes coming out of his hands. And he's heaving, trying to breathe his final breaths. And then, you know, he's done. And you hear the thunder. And then they bring you out and say, you know, what you've seen is real. Don't let Satan send you to hell. Please come with us. And, and then they would present this plan of salvation, you know. And, and looking back, I think to myself, what, what abuse is this? What, uh, how cheap is that, you know? Uh, the more I think about it, the more – but I've never seen anything like an abortion going on. Yeah, yeah they, uh, they stopped doing it after that year because – a lot of uh, a lot of people got offended because they were showing abortion. It, apparently, in Oklahoma, it's okay to show someone dying in a car crash, suicide, drug overdose, but showing an abortion that's just a little too uh, graphic and and not fun for the kids. Yeah. Well, if you see something called a hell house, uh, you might want to do a anyone listening. You might want to do a little homework and make sure that it's like. Hell House is the name of a legitimate haunted house and not some church-oriented salvation indoctrination technique, which is becoming more and more common. Thanks for sharing that story out of Oklahoma. Much appreciated. No problem. Thank you. All right. Take care of yourself. I had two thoughts. Number one is the one, the most popular one that I can think of right now. I think they run, I want to say they run like close to 100,000 people. I mean, it's hugely popular, 100,000 people through a year at like 10 bucks a head. You know what I'm saying? My second thought was, if people go to hell for having adultery, you're going to find a whole lot of people in the church. <laughs> I'm just saying that. <laughs> you're going to find a whole lot of quote unquote saved people in hell. Area code, area code 407. Thanks for your patience. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. We talk about ghosts and Halloween, and who's this? Hey, it's him. All right, talk to me. You got an opinion or a spook or a story uh, or something? I, I, got, I got a little story. All right, yeah. so this summer, usually during the summer, I go to my cousin's house and sleep over. He lives like 15 minutes away, so it's all good. Um, usually we stay up late at night, even though my aunt does not take very kindly to that idea. So uh, he, I sleep like on – he's a bunk bed. I sleep on the top bunk, and so it's about 2 a.m. He's watching videos on his laptop, and I'm playing on his iTouch. And we're talking like, oh, you know, uh, this new video game that's going to come out this year or something. So we hear 
this loud bang, like this loud metallic bang, because his room is right, right next to the laundry room, and the laundry room connects to the garage. So his bedroom wall is connected to the garage. So we hear this loud bang coming from the garage. It sounds like somebody um, punched a metal door, like the garage are really, really hard, and just this, this, this incredible like, loud bang. We, we freeze, and we, we were freaked out, and my, and my cousin, he's just like, oh, my God, what was that? And then my aunt comes in. She she barred us in the room, and she's like, well, what did you do? Because she thought it was us. And we're, and he he's like, no, 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 we didn't do anything. Don't be accusing us when we're just sitting here. So, but, so then we, when, so then obviously my, my cousin and I, we're scared. So we just sit inside his room, and he's like, all right, no, 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 I'm going to be back. So he goes out. I'm, I'm, I'm still scared, so I'm just, like, holding his eye touch. I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? He comes back with his with the with a pool table because he he has a pool table, so he breaks it up into two parts. He gives one part to me. He's like, "All right, this is what we do." <laughs> Somebody comes in, we beat the crap out of him. You know, like, "All right, all right, all right, I got this." Well, I talk about you know what what it is, what it possibly be. Do we hear somebody knocking on the front door? It's like really loud knocking, and then we start really freaking out because we're like, you know, who is knocking on the freaking door at 2 a.m. in the morning? It's just really really loud knocking, and then. I was going to find out it's my aunt because she, she apparently, like, locked herself out of the garage or something like that, and she had to get in the garage. It's a good thing you guys had the pool cues. Forget the priest. You come after me with a pool cue, and I'm a ghost. My ass is out of there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you Bye. so much for the call. I appreciate Bye. it. Yeah. Thank you, too. Uh, Michelle sent a message. She said, you know what scares me? Those big windmills. The white ones that are supposed to save the planet, yeah, they scare the crap out of me. I didn't know I was scared of them until I saw a bunch of them in fields all around me driving through Indiana. I felt like they were going to get me, like fly off and chop up the car and stuff. I had like an anxiety attack. I was shaking. It was so weird. I know it was irrational, but I couldn't help it. I couldn't stop what I was feeling. Yeah, Michelle, you're driving through Indiana and you see these huge 200 foot tall windmills made of white and you hear the sound they're coming for you area code 630 thanks for your patience who is this oh this is Marcus what's going on Uh, thanks for having me on this is the first time getting on your show well, I've had you on the switchboard on hold for like a half hour. I'm so appreciative of your patience. What do you have for us today? Ah, uh, two short stories. Uh, now, I know you talk about poltergeists. Mm-hmm. Well, in my house, um, my my dad did a lot of renovations on the house, put in new windows, new doors. And if you leave the windows open on a, on, on a windy day, the wind will just shoot through the house and slam every bedroom door in the house. <laughs> well, I, it, I'm not kidding. Like two, three doors will just slam like some big guy just took the door and just hurled the door shut. Oh, that would freak so, me out. Oh, yeah. No, oh, imagine yeah. this at like 2 o'clock in the morning if you forgot to close your window. Yeah, you're just not getting back to sleep after that happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, you know, so I can totally see how anyone would think they've got poltergeists in the house, you know. And yeah. I, I knew this is, you know, this is just the wind because I've had the door slam shut after, a, you know, a gust of wind right in my face. Yeah, now I'll freak you out. So, What's the second one? The second one is where I, I, the, uh, I, I work in an animal hospital, and where I work, the building's only 40 years old, but a friend of mine works there, too, and we have a night shift on weekends where you'd come in, you'd clean up the animals, and it'd be like 8 or 9 o'clock at night. So you're there all alone. Well, he swears he had seen a, a woman in a red dress. And we have no idea where this came from. And, you know, when you're all by yourself in a building where you're in the center of a field, there, there's not another, you know, there's, there's not a street light for, like, a block in every direction. So it's black. And it's, no, that it, it's just me out. yeah. Yeah. No, it's, so, it's the it's the daughter of Satan or somebody out there. Yeah, I totally get this. <laughs> yeah, so well, it, it makes a great story for whenever anybody new came into the building and became you know became a new employee because then we we'd stick them on the night shift and be like, <laughs> oh yeah, watch watch out for the lady in the red dress. We've got a ghost in the building. There's a lot of high turnover in that particular position. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it, uh, it, it's great, but that, but then you get that feeling because even though I know it's a load of crap, and 
he may or may not have ever really seen it. At, whenever you're in the building alone, you know, at, at 10 o'clock at night or something, you kind of get that creeping feeling over the back of your neck, and it just makes you want to take a dog around with you on a leash. No <laughs> kidding. Have you ever been around someone where you had a dog and the animal freaked out about a specific person and you didn't know what that was about? I, I kid you not. When I was growing up, we had a little girl who lived next door. I won't, I won't say her name. But every time she would come over to play with my sister, our dog would just freak out, just, you know, just, un, I mean, and it was the sweetest dog ever. And yet when she, she would come over, I guess she must have been 10, 11, 12 years old. And the dog would just, his whole disposition would change. And I'm thinking, is there, like they say, you know, they always used to say, animals can detect a spiritual presence, like the presence of evil. So, <laughs> Yeah. So is this Damien's daughter? I mean, is there something spiritual happening in this child that we need to exercise with the demons? <laughs> <You know? laughs> was was the girl scared of the dog? No, I mean she was, and you know, I she was a sweet kid, and but there was there was something a little kind of weird about her. But, it, but to see the dog just totally freak out, I always think. I always think about the film, you know, where, the, where there's a ghost in the house, and the dog is always the one who knows what's going on before any of the human beings do. <laughs> yeah. Well, happy Halloween. That, and thanks for calling the show. Much appreciated. Yeah, I love the show, and I've, I've downloaded every podcast you've made. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. And I, I, honestly, I appreciate every listener we can get, and, and I hope they're as much fun to listen to as they are for me to do. I just really, really love these shows. Thanks again. Thanks a lot. I remember when I was a kid, um, when uh, I would be the only guy home and my sisters and mom would be asleep. I had to, I was the one who locked up, right? I was the night owl. I stayed up late. So I would go to the front and the back door to lock up. And it was a routine, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd flip the lock and then you just tug on the door to make sure that the door was shut. And uh, I had, uh, I had a dream that freaked me out. And to this day, and it was exactly like it happened in real life. I'm dreaming, but this is exactly how it happened when it was 11, 11.30 at night, and I would go and lock the house up. And so I walk to the front door and lock it, and I tug on the door, boom, 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 and it's nice and tight. And I walk around to the back door, and I hit the lock, and I pull on it. And instead of going boom, 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 being totally locked, the door went and open. I mean, suddenly, and there was a dark figure about six feet tall i couldn't discern any features on the face nothing just a dark obviously male figure six feet tall right there and i'd wake up bam just like that freaked me out and as a consequence of that in real life when i would go when i would go lock the the doors I kept thinking about that dude. I'd go to the back door. <laughs> you know, I'm like kind of cracking the curtains and looking out, you know. I think it's because I was fascinated with, with scary movies even as a child, and I probably just jacked my own psyche up. You know, I'm fascinated by places that are haunted. My girlfriend was at a hotel years before we met, and she tells me this story that she stayed in a hotel that she knows was haunted. She just knows it. And so I thought, yeah... Right. And I did some homework on this particular hotel, and it turns out it's got a story. The St. Anthony Hotel in San Antonio, Texas, built in 1909, it continues to serve visitors today. Enter the lobby, you'll feel like you've been swept back in time to the earliest days of the last century. Deep, beautiful burgundy carpets and upholstery and plush chairs and huge glass chandeliers that hang imposingly from the parlor ceiling, a, a snapshot of a century ago. You think of the interior halls of the Overlook Hotel in the Stanley Kubrick film, The Shining. Remember that movie? You'll get the picture. These days, the St. Anthony Hotel remains a popular travel destination, the site of many conventions. A lot of activities take place there. It's played host to many famous people. George Clooney, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Princess Grace of Monaco once stayed there. It is also reportedly haunted. Hotel patrons have reported seeing ghostly figures of people dressed in the most extravagant attire, gracing the Anacacho Ballroom. Other sightings include a woman in red 
and a tall gentleman with a top hat entering the hotel elevators. Hotel guests say that the elevator bell dings throughout the night. With no occupant entering or leaving the elevator, nobody there. Employees call this the work of the Phantom Bellman. It's a running thing. They just talk about them all the time. Children's voices can supposedly be heard from the rooftop garden and footsteps echo down empty halls. The 10th floor, supposedly the most haunted floor of the hotel, and room 1080, the most haunted room. Employees say that this room stays terribly cold, even in the sultry San Antonio summers, and even when the air conditioning is turned off. There are strange noises. One account says there was a cleaning woman who was scrubbing the bathtub, and she saw her own name scribbled into the porcelain, like someone would scribble a name onto a misty mirror. She reportedly grabbed a supervisor who watched her scrub the name away time and time again, only to see her name reappear. The cleaning lady turned in her resignation and never worked there again. Add to this the real story of a real-life murder. 1965, a guy named Walter Emmerich reportedly checked into the adjacent Gunter Hotel, room 636, and in that room murdered a blonde woman who had accompanied him that evening. A hotel maid opened the door, and she saw Walter Emmerich standing next to a blood-stained bed, the walls, the floor, ceiling splattered in crimson red. And as the maid screamed in terror, Emmerich fled. He fled next door to the St. Anthony Hotel and attempted to get the very same room number. He asked for 636. It was occupied, so he selected the floor below it, room 536. And as the police tracked him down and surrounded his room, he shot himself dead. The murdered blonde woman at the Gunter Hotel, her body was never found. This is true. Never found. No woman matching her description was ever reported missing. No match from fingerprints found in the room. None. Some speculate whoever she was, Walter Emmerich chopped her murdered body into small, tiny pieces and flushed it one by one down the toilet. When guests at the St. Anthony reported hearing toilets flushing in rooms that are unoccupied, and sightings of a ghostly blonde woman in white near the hotel office, it speculated it might be Walter Emmerich's anonymous victim, haunting the very hotel where her killer shot himself in the temple with a 22 caliber pistol. So if you are ever near 300 East Travis Street in San Antonio, Texas, you might visit the St. Anthony Hotel. Keep your eyes and ears open, folks, especially near the 10th floor, and And if you hear the elevators without the sound of footsteps or voices, it might not be your imagination. It might just be the phantom bell. On this special ghostly and Halloween edition of the Thinking Atheist podcast, let's talk to area code 501. Thanks for calling. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? Hey, this is Andrew. Andrew, what do you have for us on this Halloween podcast? Um, I have a story of uh, the dumbest thing I've ever seen scare someone. Okay. My mother, who is uh, what Daniel Dennett would call a, a murky. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know what I mean. Yeah, explain it. Explain it. Um, she's a uh, she's not a believer, but she still uh, takes to all sorts of superstitions. Yeah. For no real reason. And one day she was taking pictures of our living room for some reason or another, and she catches one of the ghost orbs on the, the picture. She sees the ghost orb, those little round dances yeah. of light that supposedly move in the air with purpose. Yeah, in the, captures it in, in the photograph and refuses to go in the room for uh, weeks after that. Really? Even I, now? Even, even now? No, no, no. No, she eventually got over it, but uh funny thing is I uh, decided to show her that she had no reason to be afraid, and I took her camera and took the exact same picture four different times at the exact same time of day to prove to her that it was, you know, just a refraction of light. And the more times that I showed her the exact same orb showing up, she just got more and more scared. <laughs> she thought that was proof that they were after her. 
Look, I'm a professional videographer, and it's amazing how people do not know how light and lenses work and, you know, those particles of dust or whatever. I mean, they have no idea how, how you know, sunlight reflects, and, and it, they, it's amazing. But I think people really are just – they just want to believe. They want to yeah, believe, I, you know. They walk through exactly what it was, I'm sure. A room is 20 degrees colder. It's not because it's ventilated differently or because it's not insulated or there's another explanation or there's a concrete floor or it's in the basement or whatever. It's because there must be an entity causing the temperatures to go down. Thanks for the call and thanks for your patience on the switchboard. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say uh, you recently agreed to speak at my uh, university. I wanted to really thank you for that. Uh, which university? Because I've had a couple of requests come in. Is university it, uh, of Arkansas. Yeah, yeah, I, we were gonna we were gonna do that in what 2012. Yeah, I would love the opportunity to go to Arkansas and hang out with you guys. If it uh, if it all comes together, let's make it happen. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Very kind. In fact, after the free OK event, I've had uh, opportunities come up for 2012. I believe we're going to be in Canada in late spring of next year, um, Missouri, and I think they're working on the Texas Free Thought Convention for 2012. You know, that's going on, I believe, as we speak. Dawkins and and everybody is down there. Uh, I had a um, a message from Tammy. She said, I have a fear I recognize as completely irrational, and yet as someone who prides herself on being self-analytical, rational, and hell-bent on being in control of myself and my feelings at all times, I can't move past it. I'm terrified of driving over bridges. Now, bridges on their own don't scare me. Walking over bridges doesn't scare me, but driving over one, well, that's a completely different story. Tammy says, little bridge, big bridge, doesn't matter. I'm the 34-year-old mother who has to physically get out of the vehicle and walk across the bridge and have my husband pick me up on the other side. And if I'm the driver, I will alter my course to avoid having to drive over one. Probably some childhood stuff involved with that. Uh, let's see. I've got on Skype, uh, Metal Sonic is the name on my switchboard. Who is this? Hello, Zach. Can you hear me? I can hear you. What do you have for us on this Halloween podcast? Ah, fantastic. Well, first of all, uh, my name is Phil, and this is my first time calling in, so I'm glad I managed to sort out Skype to get in. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> yes. And uh, the main thing that I want to talk about is that uh, even though I'm quite a strong, you know, uh, skeptic of ghosts and paranormal activity, I, I still, like you, I still find it a very fascinating thing overall. And um, when it comes to skepticism, I feel that people tend to have, a lot of people tend to have this false dichotomy that it's either, um, you know, a ghost, it absolutely must be ghost, or it doesn't exist. And studying psychology, um, just at the high school level at the moment, but it's given me a lot of information and a lot of alternative answers that I find, you know, more fascinating than if it was, like, the paranormal. Because, like, um, you know, people are, you know, very fallible human beings, especially where, when it's, like, at night time, it's a very dark environment, it's a very spooky environment, especially if they've been suggested that... Um, you know, there's going to be ghosts there to begin with, you know. You know, if there's been, you know, suggested, they'll expect something to happen. And so there's a random noise uh, anywhere, maybe something falls over, and, you know, they'll take it. Um, it's, it's all part of the pareidolia effect. I think many of us are familiar with when we hear stories like, you know, the, the face of Jesus on a piece of toast and all that, you know. Are we yeah. talking about the power of suggestion? Are we talking about brain chemistry? Are we talking about exterior triggers that make us think and feel and and perceive these things? Where does it come from? It's a little bit of both because basically it's a, survi a survival mechanism. Like if you're just like an, uh, an ancient hominid, like in the a grassy savannah or something, and you're right at night, and you see this large, long object on the, on the ground, you may jump away and act like it's a snake. And doing that, even if it's not a snake, will be better for your, give you a better chance of survival. Because avoiding something that isn't there will train you to avoid something when it really is there. And so we see these patterns, and we also recognize human faces and things, and uh, attribute them to him. Have you ever had anything in your life that just totally spooked or scared you? Come on, there's got to be an irrational fear somewhere. Uh, well, the fact that the, uh, 
Creation Museum exists as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, being in the UK, I, I must say that uh, I it just scratch my head at how such a thing can rake in so much money each year, and people actually believe this. I mean, I mean, they they still pick particular. Uh, depict dinosaurs with cavemen and like well, wait people this is real this is this is not some kind of dystopian comic book theme park or something you know it's just the i think it's got to be the the ultimate scam i mean they can't believe this stuff i have been thinking about getting a camera and going in i have to go through the legalities of how how i do it logistically but i've been thinking about literally taking a camera and going to the Creation Museum and doing something on it. But uh, I'm not sure I can do it without crawling over the, the velvet rope and saying, what the fuck are you people smoking back there? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I know what you mean. And it all seems, it all seems to fit in like uh, when people are basing their you know judgments uh, off of emotions. And just there's a lot of post hoc rationalization going on. Yeah. And it all fits in with a, a thing in psychology called reconstructive memory. This is where you'll remember certain details of an event. However, you will also, uh, you will also when you remember it, you may repeat it uh, with something more familiar. And so when it comes to like, ghosts and paranormal or even, um, you know, looking at, you know, evidence with the God glasses, as um, you say, they'll, you know, take these pieces of little tidbits of evidence and uh, all that, and especially when they're in a very scared state of mind, they they will, you know, reach for something that's immediately identified, like it's a ghost or it was God or something of that nature. Well, do me a favor. Don't judge all of America on the Creation Museum, please. <laughs> oh no, I, Trust I me. certainly, I certainly won't. You are living proof that I that is a really bad thing to do. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the call. Thank you so much for uh, for okay. a great call from overseas, and thanks for your patience on the switchboard. Have a wonderful Halloween. Thank you. You too. Before I go, though, is it all right if I plug my YouTube channel? Please do. It's uh, Nightmare 060. That's nightmares in a uh, bad dream and 060 numbers on the end. Wonderful. Thanks for the call very much. Okay. Thank you for having me and hope have a happy all in yourself. You bet. You bet. For the record, the Creation Museum is the ultimate hell house. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? How is this place on the map? How are they receiving dollars? How are they not being laughed out of the, the neighborhoods in which they exist? It's just boggles the mind. I had uh, a few more here from uh, our Facebook crowd talking about the things that scare them and spook them and give them goosebumps and give them the chills. Rebecca said she's afraid of outhouses, terrified of them. Like going into one, you mean? Or just being around one? I mean, like going in, you know, you lock the door and you have the little latch and you're in there and there's no light. And that would be, yeah, that's kind of creepy. Amber said, you know what scares me? Opening a can of biscuits. <laughs> Is it that sound they make? That I can't even do it. You know, where it pops open? <laughs> Scary. Jack says he's terrified of Mormons. He said he runs and hides when they come to the door. Sebastian says, don't walk behind me. It gives me the creeps. Jason said he's scared of Cabbage Patch Kids. Oh, those things were creepy. For those too young to remember, Google Cabbage Patch Kid. Freaky. Uh, the um, Praying Mantis scares Albert. He says the message said there's something about the Praying Mantis. Well, I get that. It freaking rips the head off and murders the, murders the spouse. Area code 224. Thanks for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. What's your name? My name is Robert. Robert, thanks for calling the show. What's up? I enjoy when I hear you know shows like yours and others go ahead and deal with these issues and stuff, man. I I enjoy it. I, I just like listening to the show. That that I don't really have too much to say. I just want to keep listening. Well, I appreciate you listening very much. I need all the listeners I can get. Thank you so much. <laughs> you no problem. You know, it's funny in the blogosphere. I mean, there were so many podcasts out there. Um, now I'm, I, I cheat a little bit. I mean, I was a broadcaster for many, many years. And so that sort of helped me a little bit. And, uh, I've always 
enjoyed the storyteller aspect of shows like these, and I think I do it fairly well, and I think that helps. And I think our, our calls and listeners, they're smart, they're funny, they've got unique perspectives, they love to laugh. Uh, I think uh, the combination of all of those things and more has helped to, to sort of propel this show, hopefully, to the next level. It's, it's certainly something that I crave and love doing. I'm thinking for 2012 about moving to a weekly show, weekly uh, Sundays, noons, central, because it's so hard to find the show live unless you're following the Facebook chat room is where we post the preview links. So I don't know. Do you think we should go weekly? Do you think we should stay with twice a month? Is weekly going to burn everybody out? Should I bother? My final story is one that resonates with a lot of people because I think it reflects a, um, a real fear that many people have, and they certainly had it years ago. It's a real-life horror story. As reported in the New York Times on January the 18th, 1886, it speaks to the fear of the grave. And I hear this often from even free thinkers. They say, man, I'm a rational person. I know death is the end, but there's something about the grave that scares me. The New York Times, February 20th, 1885, the story of a young man named Jenkins who lived in Asheville, North Carolina. He had been sick with fever for several weeks until he finally died. But as he was soon dressed for burial, attendants found it really strange that Jenkins' body never grew stiff with rigor mortis. In fact, as he was lifted into his coffin, it was remarked he was as limber as a live man. But of course he was dead. When he expired, his flesh was cold and clammy, no breathing detected, no discernible pulse, no heartbeat. Yes, absolutely, Jenkins was dead. So why was there murmuring and speculation throughout the county that Jenkins had been buried alive? Idle gossip. Wild imaginations run rampant over eager storytellers, easily spooked townspeople desperate for something to whisper about. Within a few weeks, the coffin was exhumed for the purpose of removal and relocation to the family burial ground in Henderson County. The coffin was made of wood, and the plan was to transfer the body to a more secure metal casket for the 20-mile journey. And it was suggested they pry open the wooden casket to see the condition of the body, to see if a metal casket was even necessary. When they peeled back the coffin lid, their faces retracted in horror. Jenkins' body was lying on its back the day of the burial, face up, but now was face down. Hair had been pulled from the head in great quantities, the clothes disheveled, the fingertips broken and twisted, and all across the inside of the coffin lid were long scratches made from fingernails. Whether Jenkins had previously been in some kind of a trance or suspended animation, he certainly wasn't dead when they lowered him into the earth. Stories like these were common in the late 19th century. Medical science of the day was slow to produce a reliable checklist of vital signs. Many doctors were just too poorly educated or incompetent to tell a living body from a dead one. For this reason, an organization was formed called the Society for the Prevention of People Being Buried Alive. Proponents traveled far and wide to promote the slow process of burial. Hey, take your time. Make sure, just in case. So strong was the fear of being buried alive, some people with the means and resources actually stipulated in their wills that their coffins be outfitted with some kind of a signal, some mechanism or bell or device that would bring others to their rescue to keep them from suffering the same fate as poor Jenkins, the man who awoke inside a submerged coffin six feet under the ground and spent his last breath screaming and clawing in the darkness, crying out to the land of the living, yet condemned to suffocate to death in the garden of the dead. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com.